I had this letter that Pete wrote to me. It was right before I finally went to England to do the film. Um, basically, in the letter, he said, I know you love and idolize the Who, but there's a great danger that if you get to know us, you will hate us. You will loathe us when you see what we really are. I think, you know, he had a good idea of the experience I was going to go through, the baptism in fire. I think anybody that became involved in the, with the who, I wouldn't say I was necessarily intimately involved. I mean, I did work on this for at least four years in their camp, but there was, I think, some kind of, you know, ritualistic torture, some kind of rituals they put people through to see, you know, if you had the gumption to, like, stick it out, you know, I suppose some kind of hazing, whatever. When I went out to raise the money, again, you know, I was, you know, absolute, had absolutely no track record of any sort. Um, I'd never made a film. I'd never made a music video. There weren't music videos then. Um, I had no show reel. I had no agent. I had no representation. I had nothing except, you know, this burning desire to do this film. But I guess, you know, uh, I had, you know, whatever, what do they call now, passion, the most overused word in this business. I guess I had this passion that people felt um, to do this film. Um, it was my crusade, you know. And I would go to people. I would go, to, I'd find, oh, this guy puts up money for, you know, odd films or whatever. And I'd go see him. Some of them shall remain nameless. But I went to see one guy. Who, who looked at me across, you know, his, you know, his desk, his big desk, you know, he's probably smoking a cigar and all that kind of cliche stuff. And he looked at me and said, you want me to give you money? You want me to give you a couple million dollars to make a movie about a rock band? You're a piece of dirt. I would sweep under my carpet. I remember that. Eddie, the editor, and myself moved to Soho, where we then shared a floor of editing suites with um, Thelma Schoonmaker, who was editing um, uh, Wings Over America, Paul McCartney's documentary. And I remember um, fondly, <laughs> Paul would come up, you know, he's supposed to be screening uh, the Wings film, and of course, he'd come over to our cutting room instead and sit there and uh, <clears throat> carry on with us and, and what he loved the who is a huge who fan he loved sitting there watching this stuff and of course you know here I am I mean you know I'm this you know guy from Queens and you know I'm a rock and roll fan and here's Paul McCartney sitting in my editing room watching this I mean it was just it was incredible but um, there were a lot of incredible experiences making this film. I mean, the, the characters, uh, you know, if one was a rock and roll fan, which I was, I mean, the people I met, the legendary people, uh, I mean, I, I'd go out at night, go around the pub, the ship on Wardour Street, kind of a famous music biz pub, and it, it would be Pete Townsend and Malcolm McLaren and Kit Lambert and me. and and, and Malcolm be trying to get, you know, ideas off of, you know, Pete and Kid how to, you know, produce like a controversial band, you know, later. You know, of course, he was doing the Sex Pistols. Moments like that. Meeting Dave Clark, who, you know, from the Dave Clark Five, you know, to get the Ready, Steady, Go footage. Nick Rogue, who had made Performance, my favorite rock and roll movie, I guess, of that time, I, who had been a, a, a director of photography before he became a director. I actually asked him to be the DP. <laughs> the kids are all right. I guess I had such cheek or I was so stupid. I asked him to, to, to be, be the director of photography for my movie. You know, he's this huge director. You know, it was hilarious. I didn't know better. Um, uh, and the people out there then, it was in the middle of the, the punk movement. So, you know, you know, hanging out with, you know, Johnny Lydon and Sid Vicious. Sid still owes me five pounds, actually. But um, filmmakers, I mean, the, the, the first screening I ever had of The Kids Are All Right or the first answer print, uh, it was Marty Scorsese and Ringo and 
Patty Harrison, who you know Eric Clapton wrote Layla about. Uh, you know, it was just amazing things for a rock and roll fan to, to be in all of that. You know, have Ringo come and interview Keith Moon for you. It was, it was a unique experience. Back then, I, I, I would never want to make any kind of, you know, excuses for the film, but um, back in the day, it was very different in terms of putting a film like this together. Uh, when we did the research, there was no internet to help out. You know, it was either word of mouth or just calling or writing letters. There was no email. Um, in terms of the band maybe preserving something for posterity. Forget it. I think Pete had a couple of things. Um, I remember we went to his house, a horrible story. I'm wondering how much of this I should tell even. But uh, we were supposed to go to Pete's house and uh, we were supposed to <laughs> and pick up some pieces in his um, kind of studio on the Thames, you know, on the embankment in the Thames. And he was out on his boat back then. He used to like to go on his boat. And I got to the house and, you know, Pete's wife, Karen, said, oh, Pete was expecting you, but he's stuck on his boat. But he said, wait around. And, uh, man, we, so we, we thought, oh, we'll stick around. We'll, we'll retire to the pub. So we have a few, more than a few, waiting for Pete boat comes in, we're a little anxious because actually we had to make a flight. We had to go back to America with the bits and pieces that we had gotten. We were going to put together our reel, our, our promo reel, you know, our show reel. It was really a show reel. Show that I needed these clips desperately from Pete. Anyway, he finally shows up. We've had a few at the pub. And he, and he says, oh, Jack, hey, Eddie, here, uh, I got to go in the house, you know, check in with the wife or whatever. Here's my keys. It's in the studio on this shelf, whatever. And I, Give the keys to the kingdom or whatever, and I'll never forget there was a, this keychain, with this this thing with Mayor Baba, you know, Pete's guru on it, this like plexiglass thing or whatever, and this keychain, and I go to his room, I'm very nervous, and so on and so forth, and go and I start to open the door, so and I drop this thing, and it just breaks, and there's Mayor Baba popping out, you know, on the. And I'm just, oh my God, I'm never going to get to make this film. I mean, I just ruined Pete's treasured thing. Oh my God, you know, I, I, I just wanted some clips. And, you know, I, I went, pick it up. And thank God, I think it had just kind of like popped out. I put it together. I'm hoping he won't notice. Sorry, Pete, if you had ever noticed. I give it back to him. We hardly get these pieces. We're now very late for the plane. This is the part I'm not sure I can tell. You have to remember, I don't even have a work permit yet, and this is my dream to do this film, you know, the dream that turned into a nightmare. But we're racing to get to the airport, you know. Uh, and there's a roadblock. There'd been a football match in Pete's, Pete's neck of the woods, and there's a roadblock. There's these cops and everything. And we'd had a few, and um, <clears throat> I'll leave it at that. Maybe there was some contraband in the car. I don't know. But I say to Eddie, Eddie, what are we going to do? It's a roadblock. You know, Swissing goes, Jeff, we're not stopping. And he floored it. We went right through this uh, roadblock. <laughs> and unfortunately, it was kind of in the English countryside. They probably had bicycles and whistles, and they were just like <laughs> chasing after us. And we ditched the car at the long term parking lot at Heathrow and got on the plane. I, I thought if I get caught, I'll never make this movie. I wonder if they ever found the car. <laughs>